When I'd arrived at my parents' house on Christmas Eve, my mother was concerned, worrying about my inability to smile or eat, because as a child these were two of the things I'd always done best. You used to wake each morning with a smile on your face, she'd say, happy that she'd given birth to a being of such relentless sunshine. And because she has always shown love through feeding, it was pleasing to her that I was also a boy who ate everything on his plate then immediately pined for seconds. There was clearly never a time back then when she thought she'd have to consider me glumly wasting away. I don't want to talk about it, I'd said, preempting her questions as I made my way into her house, sad and gaunt and making a circus of carrying large gift bags through the door, lumpy paper ones filled with awkwardly shaped presents and clinking wine bottles. I huffed and I puffed and I fussed and I kissed her on the cheek. Her dogs rushed towards me excitedly and I crouched to welcome them, embracing the giddy, fluffy distraction of their enthusiasm. It helps that my mother knows that I can sometimes be dramatic, that ever since my teens I've tended to feel things intensely, my default setting during times of trouble being to announce ruin and proclaim that the sky is falling on my head in particular. My elder sister Becky can be the same way, making it a well-worn family trait and therefore nothing for our mother to worry about. So she could comfort herself with the idea that this was just one of my displays of high emotion, and that I clearly decided to exhibit that emotion in the manner of a drama student fumbling their way through a scene that required interaction with multiple props. I was all about the bags and where to put them, chattering about whose was whose, about lost gift tags and the trials of Christmas shopping. Familiar with this sort of behaviour, it could appear to my mother that this was all sound and fury signifying, if not nothing exactly, then at least very little. She didn't know that the death compulsion I was feeling that night was strong and real, and I was having to navigate it just as I have ever since I first began to feel it as a teenager, crushed under the vice-like pressures of my own dedicated portion of collapsing sky. Everyone has a worse Christmas of their life, my mother said, unable to stop herself from acknowledging my sorry state. Yours is just happening right now. There is a wisdom in statements like this, the ones that remind you to get some perspective during challenging times. But I need them six months down the line, not in the moment when it's all happening, when all I could think of was how comforting it would have been to curl up on the floor, dissolve into the carpet and wait for someone to hoover me up. What I want at times when my life goes off the rails is to be told that there has been a big mistake, a clerical error, that I can go back in time, forget that any of the bad stuff happened and carry on as happily as I did before, I want comforting, deluding, distracting nonsense, not words that make sense. So at times like this, I often feel it would be a greater kindness to put me out of my misery, bludgeon me with a spade, maybe, or poison my drink, push me into speeding traffic so I might get to enjoy the comforting escape of a coma. But don't tell me it will be OK. I know it will be. It always is. It has to be. It'll be OK, she said. You'll get through it. The details of why I was feeling so low are not really interesting enough to get into, rooted in a basic relationship failure that I was in the process of blowing out of all proportion. Boy meets girl and they fall in love. Girl breaks up with boy a few days before Christmas. Because boy doesn't do feelings in half measures, he reacts as if no one has ever experienced such pain, stops eating or sleeping, and becomes a useless puddle of grief and troubling thoughts. Boy's mother tells him to come home for Christmas because Boy has called her from the produce aisle of a Sainsbury's where Lonely This Christmas is playing over a store PA system and he wants to know exactly what kind of psychopath would write a song like that, let alone play it in a supermarket. Boy accepts that his mother does not know the answer but agrees to come home, disconnects the call and weeps. Old woman in supermarket gets annoyed at Boy because he's having a breakdown in front of the milk and she's trying to reach for a four-pint bottle of semi-skimmed. Boy realises this, picks up four-pint bottle of semi-skimmed and tries to hand it to old woman. Old woman refuses bottle because it now has tears and snot on it, tuts at boy, reaches past him and grabs a bottle of her own before bustling away. Boy stands alone in the produce aisle, holding a freezing cold four-pint bottle of snot-coated semi-skimmed milk, and listens as last Christmas begins to play over the PA system, thinking, this kind of behaviour is why she broke up with me. It was, as people like to say, a story as old as time. <laughs>